So far, the number of infections and deaths from COVID-19 across Africa have been relatively low, but the World Health Organization has also warned that 190,000 people could die in Africa during the first year of this pandemic alone if containment measures fail. What is your view on how African countries have responded to this crisis so far? Well, first and foremost, I think that this is a global pandemic that affects every part of the world. So any single death in any part of the world is one death too many. And so because it's all about our collective humanity. And so you're having a situation where Africa is starting later than others. Um, I think also you're finding that Africa is uh, not done a lot more testing as others have done. So the level of testing is still uh, fairly low. And obviously because of the weaker um, public health uh, care systems, you know, if, if this gets away from us, obviously that's going to be very, very difficult. And of course, the difficulty of African governments having the fiscal space to be able to respond very, very actively to this could become a problem. So, yes, we're just hoping that this continues to hold us low as it is, but we are planning that in case it doesn't, that we have the resources to support the countries to do the testing, to have the isolation centers, and to be quite responsive in dealing with the vulnerable groups affected. And what is the outlook for Africa's economy taking into account the possible long-term effects of the coronavirus crisis? The impact on the economies are kind of quite uh, uh, significant. You know, we expect uh, from the African Development Bank that uh, um, African economies will actually go into a recession this year. Uh, anything between minus 1.4% uh, to 3.1% uh, is what we are projecting in terms of the uh, dip in the uh, GDP growth rates for the continent. But if you look at how much Africa is actually going to lose, it's a lot of money. I mean, you're talking about anything between $157 billion of GDP loss to anything about $212 billion. Um, you know, um, and so that's a lot of money, you know, this year and next year. So that's that's really big impact. And of course, as you know, uh, these impacts have actually affected many of the countries uh, in terms of the revenue that they're getting. Uh, in particular, you know what has happened with the oil prices. The oil prices have essentially collapsed. Uh, it has actually declined 50% since January. So uh, you see government revenue has been really affected and therefore ability to cope has been affected. So Africa will need significant amount of resources to allow it to be able to cope with this particular global uh, 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 pandemic. And the African ministers of finance have said Africa will need anything about $150 billion. And our own estimate shows that Africa will need anything between $115 billion to about $150 billion, or $154 billion, let me say, this year. Well, let's talk about that financial assistance more. I mean, your organization has announced a $10 billion loan facility in response to this crisis. Where is that money going and who can access it? That facility is uh, to provide resources for immediate liquidity for the countries, to support the countries to be able to buy the equipments that they need, to be able to support uh, the private sector in particular. Don't forget the private sector is the key to the economy. So we're providing about $1.4 billion of that to our $10 billion to the private sector, support them in terms of guarantees, in terms of lines of credit, uh, to support them in, uh, in fact, in reprofiling their debt, both principal debt and also in terms of the uh, interest payments on their debt for the private sector clients that we have. And a lot of our support to the private sector is actually going to be for the SMEs, as you know, uh, the greatest share of the sector, uh, the private sector in Africa is actually the smaller and medium-sized countries. We are paying a lot of attention, you know, Vanessa, to uh, the fragile states, small countries, you know, the, uh, that are landlocked countries, and it's actually more difficult for them to even get access to equipment, to medicines, to all the things that they need. We're paying great attention to those countries. We call them the, uh, in, our, in, in the bank, we call them the African Development Fund countries. These are the countries that don't get loans from us, but they actually get grants from us. And we have a total uh, of $3.1 billion dollars set aside for those countries to be able to uh, get access to resources they need. For the countries that are the oil exporting countries, the, uh, the ones that are the bigger countries, uh, we have about $5 billion set up uh, for them to be able to access it. And does that wider loan facility package, does that include cash payments to certain sectors, for example, laborers, to make lockdowns and restrictions more sustainable? And, and are you confident it's reaching those areas and the people who need it the most? The informal sector, are badly, badly affected by it. The small and medium-sized enterprises are affected. You take, for example, the whole issue of the lockdown that uh, you know everybody was practicing. Well, it's okay, but you know while the developed economies can lock down and have a lot of money to support small and medium 
uh, size enterprises and to make compensatory wage payments during the lockdown. Africa just simply doesn't have that. And you have about 80% of the labor force that's largely small and medium-sized enterprises and the informal sector. So there's really no money for that. So there's no option but to actually gradually open up that economy. But as they open up the economy, one has to pay a lot of attention to vulnerability, in particular, you know, the more vulnerable countries, the more vulnerable parts of the population, uh, the, the, those that are in the informal sector, and the smaller and medium-sized enterprises. We are, as part of our own support, going to be working with our regional member countries to also have policy reforms, you know, policy reforms to diversify the economy, policy reforms to also make sure that they are increasing the share of the government expenditure that's going to be going to critical sectors, social sector, social protection. Those critical things are very, very important. It's not just the macro stuff. You've got to worry about bread and butter of every single person on the street. And you've talked a bit about the, the approach in the developed world. Uh, in Europe and the U.S., we've seen fiscal rules sort of thrown out the window as governments try and support their economies through this crisis. Do you think that restrictions on countries like Zimbabwe, for example, which can't access funds from international financial institutions because of arrears owed, including to your own organization, should those restrictions be lifted during this pandemic? And if not, what are those countries supposed to do? Well, you know, quite honestly, I think that uh, as I said, you know, this is all about collective humanity, right? Every single life matters. And it doesn't matter where that life is. Every single life matters. Uh, this is not a creation of any uh, uh, country. Uh, Zimbabwe and other countries that are under sanctions did not create the coronavirus. They, it's not It's not that. It's just a global uh, uh, health externality that they are facing. And so what do you want them to do? We can't leave them to die. I have actually argued but the countries that are under sanctions, we need a special way of dealing with that. And we are going to our board actually um, uh, 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 this week, you know, to provide, to, I mean, for our board to consider support for Zimbabwe. It's not a loan, but they're going to be looking at a grant support that will allow them to be able to respond to this, to be able to pay their front um, uh, uh, workers, the doctors, the, the technicians that they need to buy the personal protective equipment, to buy the medicines, to get the ambulances that they need, and to be able to uh, literally uh, pay for isolation centers. Look, if we if we actually at this time distance ourselves, right, and I've made that point that we can do social distancing, but we shouldn't do fiscal distancing for anybody, for anyone. And in terms of debt relief for African countries, the G20 has announced a freeze on bilateral government loan repayments until the end of this year for low-income countries. Does this go far enough? And do you think, um, going back to this point about, you know, country specifics, do you think that a one-size-fits-all approach can actually work here? Well, first and foremost, I think that it's a very... I, I, I commend the G20 uh, for the initiative. I commend also the African heads of state uh, for engaging with the G20 heads of state and government. It's a very good thing that the G20 has done uh, to, to, to actually discuss about the debt moratorium for least developed countries. And in this case, in a lot of low-income countries are actually in Africa. And the fiscal space has essentially tightened around them. Now, if they were to actually finance a lot of their uh, you know, fiscal deficit, you know, they will have to actually they have no choice but just to go and borrow. But they're going to have to borrow in a market that's very tight. The liquidity is not there. Uh, many of them are getting downgraded. So they do need to have the fiscal space. So I think the G20 initiative to have debt uh, reprofiling, it's a very, very good uh, uh, initiative. And I think that could allow, I mean, uh, African heads of state have called for debt cancellation. Um, that's been pushed uh, uh, in the discussions. If that were to, to, have ha I mean, to happen, I mean, that will easily free up anything about $130 to $150 billion for Africa and create the fiscal space that they need. And you mentioned eurobonds there. So should African countries with debt obligations and eurobonds, should they be receiving help here too? Well, yes. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's like um, if, you, if you're really going to um, deal with this particular problem, it has to be a comprehensive uh, 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 approach. And I think the approach being taken is comprehensive. So... Um, you know, th there's going to be a lot of conversations going on with the G20 uh, between us as multilateral development bank, but also with the commercial, I mean, those that are in the eurobond markets, and of course with the rating agencies. You know, the rating agencies matter. They have to be part of this conversation as well. What do you think is the right balance between African countries receiving assistance from the IMF, from the international community, versus homegrown initiatives from African governments and from organizations like yourselves? 
Well, you know, I mean, for us, we, we, you know, I, we believe that, uh, you know, charity belief, you know, begins at home. And we have come out very, very strongly with a $10 billion support. And be, be beyond that also, Vanessa, we, we did something that was quite uh, exciting for us at the bank here for the whole continent. We, 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 we launched a social, uh, a five coronavirus social bond on the international capital market for $3 billion. Uh, that $3 billion, um, it was oversubscribed. By the way, it is the largest um, a, a, the uh, a social impact bond that is US dollar denominated in world history ever in the history of the world. And that's listed now you know, on the London Stock Exchange, and which has been oversubscribed to about $4.6 billion. So these that we are providing, you know, we are also doing debt reprofiling for the private sector entities that are our clients, and those are local solutions that we are also providing. And of course, you know, as we also deal with this issue, one has to look at the importance of local currency financing. Because, you know, when you have countries that are having high, uh, I mean, their currencies are getting depreciated. Uh, as you have depreciation, uh, you also have the, the capital flights that are actually happening in many of these countries, Africa, all the uh, emerging markets have lost at least $70 billion of capital flights since, since January. Even the local corporate bonds that have been issuing, uh, the, because of the of, of, of this, many of those resources have been living. So Africa has no choice but to develop local solutions. However, as I said in the beginning, we need to make sure that there is fiscal space, right? You need some, some space to breathe. And so that's why I think a collective approach to make sure that there can be um, a, a fiscal space expansion for African countries, while at the same time working on the local solutions solutions as we have been doing here, uh, making sure that those things can connect together, that's the right way to go. And looking ahead to the long term, do you think if Africa fares better from this virus in, in health terms, which would obviously be a very good thing, um, do you think that the economic impact could actually be far worse in the long term? Well, don't forget that Africa, you know, has uh, six uh, or seven of the ten uh, fastest growing economies in the world until this happened, you know, and, and, and so you see that we have to continue the same trajectory in the long term. As we shift from the emergency mode, hopefully with the uh, containment of the virus and also the development of vaccines, um, that you will find that we will have to continue. You've written about the threat of locust 19. Do you think, first of all, can you explain to our viewers what that is? And do you think that that combined with the threat of COVID-19 could create a sort of perfect storm threatening Africa's economy right now? Yeah, you know, I mean, that is a Absolutely true. You know, while we are all trying to deal with the COVID-19 situation, there is another looming larger crisis that we are going to be facing in Africa, and that is from desert locusts. Now, these locusts have invaded uh, East African countries. I mean, you can think about it. You have roughly 150 million locusts, that are insects, that are in a kilometer square. They can consume food for 35 of, that can feed 35,000 people literally in that single day. So that tells you that, um, you know, yields are going to be drastically affected. Our food production is going to go down significantly. We're looking at the possibility that, in fact, the number of hungry people in Eastern Africa region may rise to 30 million people. Well, you know, so you have a challenge here. In that, if you make it right through COVID-19, there's a high possibility that you could actually die from hunger. And so we must, at the same time, work on COVID-19 um, health prevent, you know, uh, uh, interventions to mitigate this crisis. But we must also focus on this rapidly developing case of locust uh, uh, invasions in East Africa that they say it is basically of biblical proportions. It's just amazing the numbers. If we're not careful, locust, I mean, uh, COVID-19 will also lead to what I call uh, locust 19, and that would be a disaster. And finally, what impact do you think the coronavirus crisis will have on other priorities for the African Development Bank? For example, investing in renewable energy in Africa. We will continue to do the same things that we've been doing. Electricity, making sure we can feed Africa, we can help Africa to industrialize, we can create jobs for the continent, and we can integrate the continent. These are the things that we are doing on the highway. This coronavirus is just a detour of the highway. And by God's grace, we'll finish that detail. We'll come right back to the same agenda and we'll continue because that Africa needs to move faster and African economies will come out of this 
coronavirus, provided we have all the support around the world to give it the fiscal space it needs more resilient to continue to do what it must do, which is to actually grow fast and, and improve the quality of life of its people. Dr. Adesina, thank you very much for your time.